SBC Media. Welcome to iGaming Daily, analysing the news from the betting and gaming industry all over the globe. Supported by SBC Summit Barcelona, the industry-leading conference bringing you the future of sports betting and iGaming. SBC Summit Barcelona is where you can experience the entire global industry coverage under one roof. Join 10,000 industry professionals for three days of game-changing conversation and education. Get your tickets now at sbcevents.com. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of iGaming Daily. Due to popular demand, I am your host once again. I'm Craig Davis, the editor of Casino Beats and Slot Beats. We are here for part two of our deep dive into all things slots. I have my team here. I'm delighted to say joining me once again to give their insights, um, and they will now introduce themselves. Hello, my name is Connor Porter. I am a senior journalist on Casino Beats. Hi there, I'm Danny Lee, business journalist for Casino Beats and Slot Beats. So like I say, this is part two. Uh, we did a deep dive into slots last week. We'll be starting with some slots today, ending with slots, and hopefully we'll have We'll have a little bit of fun in the middle. After all, it is Hyde United's first game of the season today, so we need to have some fun to mark that occasion. So branded slots is where we're going to start today. I'd like to get your opinions on this. A bit of a bit of a broad intro here. Uh, opinions on branded slots do, from both maybe an industry and player perspective, do they gain traction with players? Is there longevity in branded slots? Do they need to be left behind? So I think I think branded slots definitely are gaining traction with the industry and with the player base themselves. You know, when you look back uh, throughout the years in terms of the brands that have always stood out, it's the ones that are always recognisable with the wider audience, whether they be part of um, you know culture, uh, modern culture, or, or or past pop culture. You know, we have to think of like things like Wheel of Fortune. Uh, or Peaky Blinders the TV show have been incorporated into slots um, and then you've got you know slots like in the past year like Elvis Frog uh, obviously based off uh, the musician Elvis Presley you know so those kind of brands uh, definitely appeal to the wider audience but at the same time we are st- starting to see a rise of more of a storyline uh, slots within the industry and those two ideas can coexist with one another Um it's all about though are we getting to the point where it's difficult to introduce a story slash brand that's new that hasn't been seen before in the industry are we getting to that point now where you know uh, as we've said time and time again slots are starting to look same same as before you know samey same um as as they have been are we getting to that point now within the industry that's the uh the crucial talking point i think when it comes to uh to brands and storylines and those kind of uh features when it comes to slots moving forward branded slots obviously bring quite a lot for a supplier in terms of that instant recognizability they can help them sort of stand out in casino lobbies uh, one of the more recent ones i've seen was actually um, a lara croft uh, sort of tomb raider slot and i mean that's something i mean lara croft itself you know has been implemented into movies from video games so it's already like uh, got that status there of being something that can be shared across different industries and yeah i think the sort of a good for suppliers to sort of utilize but i think there's only so much that they can bring to a supplier i don't think there's quite like you've mentioned there the the storyline or narrative that um suppliers can build with those slots for example you're not going to find like um the next slot series um with a branded slot, you can't build on something that they've created themselves and then bring um, multiple iterations of their own creation through that way. But yeah, that doesn't mean they're not useful. So your points there, and just just kind of throwing back to the SBC Summit Barcelona last year, I know there was a lot of pessimism at the event regarding branded slots, which is why I just wanted to bring it there. It's kind of, for me, it's kind of the engagement and stickiness and we kind of touched on this last week from an operator's perspective. It's something new and something unheard of. How much does an operator take this seriously, even if it is branded in a certain way that may appeal to them? It's a kind of a point I'm going to get back to a little later, because in my opinion, the whole innovation debate, which is how we are going to end, 
hinges a lot on the actual casinos themselves supporting unique concepts. Without the support of the casinos, everything's just going to be the same. And speaking of things looking the same, again, I said last week, I'm not slagging off this mechanic. It's just hugely popular. We look at mechanics. You can't look at mechanics without mentioning Megaways. Big time gaming have done a tremendous job with Megaways. It's a sellable brand to so many other suppliers, as we see. So I'm simply going to ask you both, is that method hindering innovation? I think you've got to look at it from, like you said, that sort of casino perspective. You know, if a casino isn't a a fan or doesn't believe that it sort of um, produces player engagement or um, sort of keeps, uh, well, retains players as well. So looking at an innovation side of things, Yes, it's managed to sort of make this sort of big name for itself in the slot industry. It's probably the most recognizable mechanic. Um, But in terms of sort of hindering innovation, I think you could argue both ways, really, because it's not just, not every Megaways game is the same. There are little uh, differences that uh, studios can make, uh, ways that they can sort of build on that established brand that's already there. But at the same time, you know, it's maybe closing a few doors in terms of uh, studios developing their own mechanics and, you know, maybe trying to create something that can be as big as Megaways was. Or is, I should say. And it's the same point that I made last week about innovation versus attention. You know, clearly the the Megaways mechanic is drawing a lot of attention. It's very popular amongst players. And that's why a lot of, a lot of uh, slot studios are, are looking towards that direction. But at the same time, something that is so successful, such as Megaways, can inspire other studios to try and create something in NFT to, that can potentially uh, match it or, or leapfrog it in terms of popularity. So it goes back to that, um, that, that argument that I made last week about innovation versus attention. You know, the two... As like I said last week, the two can be at opposite ends of the spectrum, but at the same time they can live ha- uh, harmoniously. So it's um, it's 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 something to consider, and I think there's you know there's clearly two points of view that you can have with it. But I think at the same time you have to you have to approach the situation as what can what can a slot studio do that could potentially be the next version of uh, of me- of uh, Megaways on the market. What can it do in order to try and um, leapfrog or match what the the success that Megaways has had um, within uh, casinos in the industry. I think that's a good point, kind of touching on the determination that this can kind of bring about in other suppliers to kind of surpass Megaways in a way. I mean, the, the reason I wanted to touch on this, I've got a lot of friends who play slots and I'm not saying this is a sample pool that can be taken seriously in any respect, but a lot of them are of the opinion that Megaways is destroying innovation because everything just looks the same. So I just thought it was an interesting point to touch upon and similar to your point there, Connor, that's what I'm usually saying. I'm throwing up studios like go and look at Avatar UX, for example, have had tremendous success in their own way with their, with their own mechanics. So we'll kick the can down the road a little bit. We'll look at M&A. Again, I don't really think we could have a two-part slots discussion without looking at M&A. We've spoken about this a lot internally. I know the usual host, James, loves to call this the the Disney route, he calls it, touching on Star Wars, Marvel, and kind of how much they're able to churn out franchises like they are, like we're, we're seeing now. So we'll translate this over to iGaming. We see more companies obviously be acquired. You've got Evolution, for example, who've bolstered with No Limit City, NetTent, Red Tiger. There's numerous examples. Games Global, for example, bought Micro Gaming's entire back catalogue. Um, so this strengthening of slots portfolios is coming in a big way through this M&A process. How does that process impact what's potentially being produced by suppliers, do you think? So... I think there's quite a pessimistic view of the whole uh, Disney um, approach to like companies and conglomerates and stuff like that. But it's that's usually to do with it maybe sort of saturating the content that they're producing because you'd think that like the same companies owning like other studios will probably lead to like a similarity in what they're all producing and maybe sort of diluting the content that they're pushing out. However, I think when it comes to 
slots and this industry and maybe even the video game industry as well. I think what you've got there when a big company sort of takes over other companies is that, you know, you've got one supplier sort of balancing different business deals and operate agreements and that may like sort of free up the developers to sort of maybe focus a bit more on their projects, on the new games that they're trying to bring out. And I think on the other hand of that, there is also a worry that maybe they're going to try producing slots to appeal to the same operators because their parent company is obviously um, making deals with operators that all the companies underneath them uh, will be you know, selling slots to. But alternatively, maybe there's a chance that these affiliate suppliers can combine their creative forces in order to produce maybe more innovative games that have new and unique mechanics. So maybe they can join forces a bit there as well. So to, to add to Danny's point, um, you know, just earlier this year in April, we saw Green Jade Group, unfortunately, uh, shut down its online game studio um, because of uh, a statement a statement from the CEO said they had to close because they didn't look out when it comes to uh, the perfect recipe of timing, maths, features, and front end for their games. But it wasn't too long after that that they were purchased from uh, purchased by sorry uh, Raw Eye Gaming, uh, their full arcade games portfolio. So it showed that they had ideas, but particularly they weren't able to you know find the right backing maybe. Um, earlier on in the process in order to uh, keep on developing the innovation and get the right um, the right space in order to, to show that innovation going forward. But, you know, hopefully with partnership, the acquisition with Raw Eye Gaming now that, you know, a studio like Green Jade Games can um, progress um, moving forward. It's an interesting point, the kind of how much does it rely on the backing of maybe a larger company. I mean, I want to go back to Games Global. I mentioned them at the top of this uh, this question on M&A. And at ICE in February of this year, I was fortunate enough to be invited on the Sunborn, which uh, Games Global had hired out. And it had this, I, I can't remember exactly the wording, they phrased it, but they had this kind of section of the on the ship and it had a ton of rooms all the way down. And they'd separate it off as kind of like, a walkway of different studios. So in each room was one of the different studios within the Games Global umbrella. And it was, I, th I think they said they had close to 50. There wasn't 50 there, but there was a good kind of 15, 20. And it was interesting from that point of view to see how a company like Games Global can use each of its different studios in kind of a different capacity. So for example, it has one of the studios the name the name escapes me, but it's focused on your your big budget high production slots, and then you can have other studios that are kind of focused on maybe something a bit more traditional. You can have a couple that are just purely focused on new innovations, and they kind of split their operations in such a way that they can they can kind of try all these different things within the, their whole umbrella of studios. So, to a company like Games Global, if you're a smaller company trying to come in and challenge that. You've kind of got a the eggs in one basket, I suppose is is the way is the way I'm going. And if we're looking at things that having a lot of different studios in under your umbrella can do, and I'm not saying Games Global are going down this route, it's just an awful segue. Apologies. There's plenty of other games coming up. Crash games, Danny, I know you've done quite a lot of work on crash games. You've got Crash, you got mine, you got Dice, etc. 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 I'm sure I don't have to go into how these games work. We all know by now. So to kind of double barrel this question and to stop me talking, firstly, are any or all of these new game types a challenger to slots realistically? Could this focus on new game types hinder slots or can slots learn something? Well, firstly, you can sort of look at the sort of rise in these type of games in the past few years as maybe sort of correlating to the sort of lack of innovation that we've seen in slots. So maybe... To look at the question from um, another perspective, maybe the lack of sort of creativity in slots has sort of led to the popularity in these uh, instant games. Uh, I usually call them like Crash and Mine and even Plinko and stuff like that. So you would hope that maybe 
that could then work the other way as well. So because these crash games are becoming more popular and we're seeing different game formats introduced to the industry, maybe that can maybe inspire something from s- slot suppliers to um, come up with new mechanics, new features that n- don't necessarily copy um, these other games because I know there are quite a few games out there that maybe consider themselves a hybrid of different game formats, but just maybe use what players like about these games, the engaging features, um, the social aspect of them games is very big these days. So if you can br- maybe bring some of that into slots, I don't see why it couldn't inspire innovation rather than hinder it. Exactly. And I think to build on that point, Danny, you know, these these games, Crash Mine, Dice, you know, they offer different gaming experiences to slots and that's why they're, they're gaining attention. But at the same time, these types of games, the genre of games, will run into the same problem as slots if they don't continue to innovation and provide that variation moving forward. And you've touched upon social aspects here. I feel like we can't touch on social aspects and iGaming without at least touching on streaming a little bit. Again, Danny, you've done a lot of work on this recently. Maybe talk us through some of these latest developments. It's cause There's been a lot recently. And then maybe take a slight look to look at the uh, I think he's called XQC deal with Kick recently formerly with a big following on Twitch I believe it's a two-year non-exclusive deal with the streaming platform 70 million dollars incentives can push that up to 100 million Um, I'd like to get your opinion on the NS we've seen lots of contentious opinions um, but thoughts on the dinner is it a serious matter is it a market employee is it a gambling sponsorship is kicker to compete with Twitch or is it way wider than mark to suggest something like that? Well, definitely not. I think the way kick has come about is as a direct competitor to Twitch from the start, considering, you know, it's got backing from um, the people behind stake, which are obviously taken, uh, well, they were um, part of the Twitch's regulation changes back in October to make sure that sort of uh, on well, illicit uh, gambling that was done on stake and uh, other like crypto casinos and um, unregulated online casinos were offering uh, to streamers on there. So I think it's just developing constantly, this story. I mean, XQC was uh, one of Twitch's uh, biggest streamers and a hundred million deal, well, a rumoured a hundred million dollar deal for two years to join Kick is obviously huge, huge amounts of money that Twitch would struggle to to offer streamers these days with everything that's going on inside that company. But we could talk about that uh, for hours and hours. And it's in terms of whether you know Kick can maybe rival Twitch. I think the story still has a lot to play out. To be honest, there's. If Kick can keep gaining Twitch's biggest streamers, um, then, you know, it's bound, it's bound to be a competitor that it needs to take seriously. But you just wonder how long spending so much money on a streaming website that's not even a year old, you know, how good can that be in the end? Yeah, to, to bring it back to, uh, to uh, for slots and, and innovation in that aspect with streaming, um, Certainly, whatever a streamer is playing can be used as market research for slot developers, you know, looking at the type of slot that they're playing, what kind of brand, you know, all the things that we've already talked about already, whether it be mechanics or brand or, or what kind of, um, um, what kind of game it actually is, you know, if it falls into those, you know, crash or dice games, if whatever market research can be taken from the slots that these streamers are playing, that should be used as an indication by slot developers as to what needs to be explored and developed and where the gaps are in the market that could potentially help them develop innovation more into their slots and create a game that could potentially be, you know, uh, the next the next big thing in the online casino space. So the next big thing in the online casino space, let's look to the future. Where do slots go from here? What does the future hold? How do studios innovate? How do studios innovate? I think it's just a, a, a mixture of what we've already said, you know, from the last point, what I said, um, you know, looking at what the streamers are doing, because that is the, the, the modern, the modern age of, of slots right now it is playing it on 
online and having other people interact with you in a social aspect, like we've already discussed, um, that's the direction of slots moving forward. But also you have to take into account what we said right at the beginning of the first part of this podcast as well, which is uh, innovation versus, you know, attention in that aspect of, of slots. Everything needs to be incorporated into the line of thinking for slot developers in order to try and um, try and find a way to create the next big thing on the market going forward. And um, each each part plays its own little um, plays plays its own little role in in this uh, in this pathway uh, because each part has its own different aspect that is it's taken away from the current market um and the current players in the market and the current environment in the market as well you know we talked about the how you can go onto a casino lobby and you know there's lots of titles that look the same you know so that t- needs to be taken into account as well so it's it, <laughs> to, to give to give the bad answer and not one specific uh point it's everything mixed into a bowl and then trying to create essentially uh a, a great a great piece of art from that mixture of, of a bowl really to be honest with you yeah i think you got to touch on what we said earlier as well about sort of finding the new mechanic the new feature that can dominate the industry in ways like uh, mega ways has and so looking into sort of the coming months and years, you'd imagine that suppliers are constantly working on what they're developing themselves. You mentioned earlier Avatar UX uh, with Popwins. How can they sort of continue to establish that as a mechanic? And that's just an example of, of many other suppliers that have sort of gone for the same thing. We're looking at Wazdan as well. They have the nine coins mechanic that is quite unique in the way that it um, pays out. And I just think, like Connor said, streaming is very popular in the industry at the minute and does need to be considered um, from across the industry of how effective uh, it can be for games and suppliers. If they can create games that are more sort of optimized for streamers then and then accompany that with mechanics that can appeal to a wide audience in casino lobbies, then you think that that's what they're aspiring to do at the moment. I mean, to me, before before I round off, there's a couple of ways of looking at it. I said earlier, from the operator perspective, you can't really underestimate the roles that casinos themselves play in the innovation process. They've got to support this unique content in, in the right way, whether that's through a marketing perspective, whether that's through placings in a casino lobby. Operators have got to push this unique content for the good of their brands, and that itself will then further foster a more creative environment from the supplier side i suppose and then from that supplier side well in an, in any aspect of life like you need to stand out to excite and engage an audience you need to stand out so arguably innovation is the key to surviving this huge overwhelming wave of content that we get coming our way um but at the same time You can't push that wheel too much. It's balancing that innovation with familiarity. Reinventing the wheel every single week is just going to arguably push players away. We said last week, the familiarity with 5x3, 5x4, 5x5, etc., etc. And a constant reskinning of games is not going to work. The providers who do this will will be left behind very, very quickly. Um, so I suppose you've got to think outside the box. It's not a numbers game. It's not quantity over quality. Um, incredibly similar content will get you left behind. It's finding that right balance, in my opinion. But that's just my opinion, like I say. Anyhow, we, we are at the end of our, of our two-part dive into the slots landscape. Uh, I want to thank... Connor and Danny for joining us over the course of these last two weeks. It's been it's been great fun having these conversations with you, and I'm sure we will see you all again soon. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening to today's episode of iGaming Daily, brought to you in conjunction with SBC Summit Barcelona, being held at the Fira Barcelona Monduic on the 19th to the 21st of September. If you want to find out more about some of the subjects raised today, feel free to explore any of the sites in the SBC News Network or check out the latest edition of the SBC Leaders magazine. Happy reading.